Hello there! This is the one month update on the ecosphere with a big biodiversity. It's nice and warm outside and I thought I'd get you guys in the summer spirit by filming outside. Of course, all viewers from the southern hemisphere are also welcome. Also, Australia doesn't exist. Wake up sheeple! Looking at your ecosphere in the sun can be a lot of fun. Because you can see more vibrant colors from the plants and animals. Just be very careful that your jar doesn't get hot because of the sun. One of the most noticeable changes in the last month is that the water weeds or Elodea have been growing tremendously and have spread around the entire jar. It might not be as apparent on video as it is in real life, but if you pay attention during the rest of the video, you'll see that it is spread around the entire ecosystem. The Velisneria has grown quite tall in the past month. Not only that, it even cloned itself, forming a new Bebe Velisneria, which is always a good sign. The crypto looked a little sad last time you saw him, but he has really turned his life around and is looking fabulous now with his gorgeous leaves shining in the sunlight like an angel spreading its wings. Wow, did you just see that? Yeah, I saw it! The Hygrophila polysperma has also grown quite a bit. And the Pogostemon stellatus octopus has also grown quite a bit. It's also growing a lot of new stems from its nodes. Again, a good sign. Here you can see again just how much the Elodea in particular has grown. On top of the soil you can see little balls of Ambulia growing. Just like the Velisneria, they can reproduce asexually, essentially by producing clones. Normally those clones grow very fast, so this is an interesting growth form I've never seen before. Ambulia balls. And then on the other side of the jar we find the Ambulia plant that I had initially planted, with a few ramifications and looking good overall. Look there on the plant. Quiet, quiet. There's an animal sitting. Quiet, quiet. I hope to see him better. <coughs> Let's not forget the giant hygro, the centerpiece. Well, it's been overshadowed a bit by all the other plants. There has been an enormous growth rate in the entire ecosystem. But we can see a few healthy leaves, so we know it's doing well. There has also been some nice algae growth. Nothing excessive, fortunately and it's more than welcome. Let's move on to the floaty floaty plants. I've planted, or well, you know, dropped some water lettuce in there and it has reproduced a little. Here's my finger. The larger bumps you see floating are all water lettuce. These smaller bumps are some of the Salvinia minima and the rest of the water surface is covered with duckweed. It's very interesting to see that all the native plants have disappeared and that all the non-native and in most cases tropical plants are doing so well. I'm not all that surprised that the water weeds are doing so well because they can be found everywhere in the Netherlands but they're not indigenous. I wonder if we would have seen different results if I'd made this ecosphere in the winter with lower temperatures. But I might not even have found the native plants then. So it's all good. Let's take a look at all the snails that are living in this closed ecosystem. This is the Planorbarius corneus, also known as the Great Ram's Horn. For my observations, this appears to be the only one of its species of its size. Normally that wouldn't be a problem, as all snails are hermaphrodites and some can self-fertilize. However, I found both the sources that say the Great Ram's Horn can and cannot self-reproduce. This one might have very well been fertilized though, so I guess only time will tell what will happen. The little tube on this snail that we discussed in a previous video is actually called a siphon. It's used by a lot of mollusks and can be used to breathe, feed, reproduce and move. The great ram's horn has lungs and is also capable of absorbing oxygen from the water. So that's a fun fact I guess. In most of the ecospheres I made, the bladder snails are the dominant snail species. In this one, it appears to be the Planorbis planorbis, with the most individuals roaming around.
This beauty of a beast right here is the Radix ovata. This particular snail has a very neat pattern on its shell. The top half looks brown with yellow spots and the bottom half is the other way around. This species breathes air and will use the siphon we talked about to do so. These are snail eggs. If you look closely, you might be able to see the unborn baby snails moving around in their cell. I think these are bladder snail eggs. Speaking of bladder snails, Visa fontinalis, although they aren't the most common species in this jar, they are still species in this jar. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. This is the back swimmer. Here we have a little bit of a closer view of the little beetle ball. Last time I told you that this is a Hephidrus ovatus. Someone in the comments pointed out that it looks more like Hygrotus inequalis. Those species have very similar body shapes. The difference is in the body color and patterns. Although both species can look like the beetle on your screen, Hygrotus inequalis looks like the beetle on your screen way more often. I think that it has multiplied because this time around it was way easier to catch one on camera. I know for a fact that there are at least two, but maybe there's even three, four or <gasps> five. If there are both males and females, they might reproduce. And if the Daphnia, Copepods, Ostracots and whatever else this beetle eats also keep reproducing, then we could have a multi-generational predator-prey relationship in this closed ecosystem because there are enough plants and algae to support that many animals. And that would be really cool. Luckily there are copepods, ostracods, daphnia and other animals living in this ecosphere. I decided not to go into too much detail about them in this video, because I feel like you already know those quite well by now. Ok, I lied a little. Here's some copepods. Here's a tubifex worm that was a little startled by the camera, but it's slowly getting a groove on again. You know how it is with those boogie worms, they can't help but waving themselves back and forth. I call this piece two worms in one jar. This is a larva of an insect. I don't know what insect though, but I have a feeling that this one is very young and still has a lot of growing to do. Maybe we will be able to determine what species it is later on. This footage is filmed through a macro lens and is magnified about 10 times. The following footage is not filmed through a macro lens. Yeah, that's a dragonfly larva and it's quite big. Filming it was the first time I saw it too. And it scared me a bit because, well, I was not expecting it. I even almost said a bad word. A bad word. It is really big for an ecosphere animal, almost an inch long, and I'm somewhat surprised that it managed to grow this big. I already thought there weren't a lot of smaller crustaceans, and this explains it. Dragonfly nymphs are murdering machines. Here you can see it catch an ostracot with its impressive lower lip, but it got away, which is quite rare. But this isn't great news for the Hygrotus inequalis and the predator prey system we talked about earlier. For two reasons. One, this larva will eat a lot of prey, potentially not leaving enough for the little beetles. And two, the dragonfly might actually eat the little beetles. But here's where it gets interesting. For some reason I decided to film the larva at night. Here you can already see one of the small beetles swimming past. And well, sure enough, the dragonfly actually caught one of the little beetles. I wasn't expecting this to happen, so the footage isn't great, but it's proof that it does happen. If we take a closer look, we can see that as soon as the larva opens its jaws, possibly to regrip, the beetle gets away. 
I think, and also hope, that the little beetle's exoskeleton is too hard for the dragonfly to penetrate. Most of the time at least. If that's not the case, I think they'd all have been eaten by now. This little Daphnia, however, is in constant mortal danger. But seriously, go search on YouTube for dragonfly larvae eating stuff. It's vicious. I also discovered that there are springtails living on the glass and the water surface. Springtails never fail to put a smile on my face and I'm really happy to see them here. As you can see, they are really really tiny. You can use the duckweed leaves for scale. This is the mystery crustacean from last episode. So far I haven't been able to find out what it was. Quite some people commented suggestions, but there hasn't been a match yet. I have to admit that the footage is not particularly clear. And you might have noticed this is the same footage from the last video, because unfortunately I haven't seen it since. So that's what's been going on in the ecosphere that is very biodiverse. Thanks for watching and goodbye.